So for all of you who do not know, my name's Nat, and I'm the head of community at an organisation called Exceptional Individuals. We're a social enterprise that supports individuals who are neurodivergent, dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, you know, Tourette's, uh, anxiety, you know, all of those lovely things, and help people get decent quality jobs. Because I don't know about you, but for me, people like always try to give me like the really bad jobs, like, ah, uh, you know, you'll be perfect for this position. No, I want a good one. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to look at case examples of roles that have worked for those who have dyslexia and go from there. Now, I guess, spoiler, there isn't a perfect job for someone with dyslexia. We're individuals. Uh, everyone's different. But what we can do is look at roles that have worked for people in the past and try and understand why they've been successful and see if maybe there's some of those skills or qualities you possess. And maybe you could go on a similar route, if not different. Now, hopefully it goes without saying, but I just worth saying I'm dyslexic. So I fully get it. And I have struggled finding good employment my entire life because not through not being skilled or educated, but just finding somewhere that has the right cultural fit for me. Sanjan says, hi, Nat. I chose careers which data heavy and focus and found them difficult. Wondered if I'd have better off in another sector. It's possible. You know, it's hard to say. But there's no harm in trying new ones. I think a lot of the time when we think of the roles that we have at our disposal, we, there's only like so many we can pick from because they're the only ones we get told about. But there are so, so, so many different jobs and sectors and potential roles that we could eventually go into. So we started in 2015 and our founder, Matt, who is also dyslexic, has a lovely degree. I think he had like a 2-1 or maybe even a first. I think he had a first. Uh, yet he was unable to find a good job. And it wasn't because he wasn't capable, but a lot of roles are so strict. They expect everyone to be a generalist, kind of a jack of all trades. But those with dyslexia, that's not really how we are. So our last webinar was on neurodiversity in anime, and we do these every single week. So do check them out. You know, we've, they're all on our YouTube channel, which April edits. So, yeah, get involved. Now, to kickstart it, have any of you ever heard of this book called The Dyslexic Advantage? It's a few years old now, but it's a really interesting book. And if you haven't seen it or read it, you know, it's definitely worth a look. It's all about how dyslexic's brains have, are uniquely advantaged in order to solve certain problems and have certain outlooks. When we think of, oh dear, I can't get a job because I'm dyslexic, that seems quite negative. But actually, there are many, many roles, jobs and opportunities which we aren't just capable of getting, but actually we would have an advantage over neurotypical people, those who do not have dyslexia, for example. So I can see, yeah, we've got a few of you, a few you know. Personally, I'm not much of a like reading the whole book, but it's a good book where you can skim through and select different ones. I think the person who wrote it might be uh, Australian or from New Zealand. Years ago, I did a presentation with Dyslexic Advantage, which was my title, and they uh, messaged me, told me I had to take it down because uh, it was in copyright. I did not know. It was genuinely a uh, coincidence. However, since then, I now know that book exists and I have read it and it's a good read. So question to all of you lovely people today, what skills do people with dyslexia usually have? Now, obviously, this is a massive, wild, open question, but are there any skills that you've noticed in yourself or people that you know or family members that also have dyslexia that you see time and time again? Now, I can't stress this enough. We are individuals. There's no like, you know what? The best job for you is going to be dot, dot, dot. I can't give you that answer. But maybe if we look at the type of qualities we have, we can kind of narrow down the potential roles that not that would be good at necessarily, but roles that we would feel comfortable in and people would really value and would thrive in. Great. So we've got relationships. Yes, we tend to have high levels of empathy because we've been through it. We can relate out the box thinking that essentially meaning can we look at things from different angles? A classic example that we're going to touch upon today is um, Henry Ford, who, when someone says, I need a faster horse, he said, hold my beer, and he made the automobile. 
that was out of the box thinking. It solves the same problem, but in a completely different way. We've got strategic planning, relationships, good communication, lateral creative thinking, very, very nice. So let's apply these roles and see how they might fit in different examples. So I'm going to look at different kind of celebrities, different roles, and we are going to ask ourselves the question, why is this potentially good for someone with dyslexia, maybe yourself? Now, there's going to be roles and you'll be like, I am never, ever doing that. And there's going to be roles that aren't on this list, which you could absolutely do. But all we're going to be looking at is why the person potentially might have thrived in this position. So let's start off with Richard Branston, the first billionaire to go to space, I believe. And he is a massive business tycoon. A lot of people who are dyslexic tend to be entrepreneurs or business people. It's said that 40% of all self-made millionaires have dyslexia. And you wonder that, like, well, I'm not a millionaire, so what's going on here? Well, uh, my theory is most people with dyslexia try to kind of go along the status quo. And that's OK. Yeah. But the status quo wasn't designed for us. So normally we kind of get hit below the bar and can give up and have loose motivations. But if you decide, screw this, I'm going to do my own thing. You are allowed to be creative, use your freedom. People tend to do a lot better. So maybe, just maybe, the thing that made Richard Branson so great as an entrepreneur is the fact his dyslexia allowed him to take more risks and actually maybe be okay with failure. Because let's be honest, we probably all experienced our fair amount of failure in life or at least perceived failure. In retrospect, maybe it was a good thing. Now, to give a bit more about Richard Branson's, uh, Richard Branson's background, I've used this slide before, but it's interesting. So it just tells you his journey. In 1960s, he was a whippersnapper and he tried to sell Christmas trees and budgeries. Random, right? And he failed. No one wanted his Christmas trees and no one wanted his budgies. So whatever. He then decided to create a magazine called Student. And as a student, he was able to make 50K. That money, what I would do with that. And, you know, he was still a spring chicken at that time. Then in the 70s, he starts selling mail order records and he creates a record shop. And guess what? He calls it Virgin because he was a virgin in business. I think that was another reason, to be honest. Um, and by that point, he already made five million. So you start to see it building up. Oh, Sanjana says background and privilege play a big part in whether you are a success. You know what, Sanjan? I'm not going to lie to you. You are completely right. And Richard Branston still had a lot of things. I can't I don't know his family background, but either way, he was still male and white, you know, came from a Western country. He did have those going for him. So do not think that, you know, what if he did that? Why can I not do that? It's not a fair kind of comparison. But you can still think the skill set he used in order to make it reality, you could still use similar skill sets. So uh, thank you for bringing it up because, you know, I also sometimes get, would get down. I'm like, I'm already this age. Why have I not achieved the same level of success as others? And, you know, you can't compare, you know, it's just different scenarios. Moving on to the 80s, he starts to really branch out. You know, it's not one thing. He starts doing uh, vision, games, Atlantic, holidays, TV channels, airships, even condoms. You know, he starts branching out in all different directions. So when you ask him what job, what profession is he in? He's not in a profession. He just he's a creative. And that's what a lot of us are. You know, I, have, I did a television production degree. Then I worked in a charity. Then I did like filmmaking. Then I worked with young offenders. Now I work with people who are neurodiverse. I'm always changing. And I realized that shouldn't be seen as a failure of me. It's actually what makes me good, I suppose. That kind of innovation, that being able to like bob around. Then moving to the 90s, which is a great decade, by the way. He does more services and he's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Still, there's no real trend. Everything seems to be quite different. He likes music, but he also likes spacecraft, 
this and other things. 2000, he's creating even more, and he never, ever stops. Obviously, this wasn't about the money. This was more about creating things. What he would typically do is create something and then give it away or kind of be like the chair, but really not bother with it too much. And now he's even going into space. So my question to all of you is, why do you think dyslexics seem to change jobs a lot? Now, is this because we can't retain the jobs? Maybe. Is it because we get bored easily? Maybe. You know, I, I, I want to know your views and opinions on this. Because maybe if we can start to understand why people with dyslexia can find it harder to find employment or to find the right job for them, we can, it might help us narrow down the type of roles which could be useful. I appreciate this is a hard question and there's no right answer, so just your best speculation. Okay, we've got multiple interests. Yeah, I would say so. People with dyslexia, but why do we have multiple interests? Isn't that everyone? You know, what makes us particularly unique in that? There may not be an answer. It's just a good question to ask. We've got roles or sectors don't fit financial demands. Yeah, another reason that is true. We need money. So any job will do. And maybe you just find any job and eventually that any job actually turns to be a job you're really good at. Let's face it. A lot of people don't actually want to go into sales. But yet it's been I've seen time and time again, people with dyslexia tend to be really good at sales. I guess we don't always know what we're good at until we try it. Did I honestly think I'd be doing this job when I was younger? No, I thought I'd be like an artist or a cartoonist. But I realized I'm much better at this. We've got understanding myself better and choosing jobs that better align. Yes, keep redoing it. I have a lot of friends who have, um, they say, oh, I don't really want this job. I'm like, mate, you need a job at the moment. Get that job. You can always leave. So don't feel that you're putting your whole life away when you take a job that doesn't completely align. Get it? Then look for the next one. Then get look for the next one until you find that one that suits you. And just like Richard Branson, you might never find the job that's right for you because for you, it's not about the job. It's about just creating things. We got they can struggle to work on wordy areas of a job, such as web chats. Yeah, maybe it's not all rainbows. Maybe it's because there are less jobs available or as the job description changes. There's been tribunal cases. That's when people go to court where someone was on the telephone. And then they updated the system and then it was on web chat and they just couldn't do it. So got fired. Well, that's because the role they signed up for wasn't the role that they ended up doing long term. So, yeah, great answers, everyone. So a quick quote from Mr. Sir Richard. My dyslexia has shaped Virgin right from the very beginning and imagination has been the key to many of our successes and probably rich family. It's helped me to think big, but to keep our message simple. And that quote at the bottom is what I think really resonates. People with dyslexia are good at thinking big. What does that mean? It means that we will think of things that haven't been done before, but we're able to communicate it in the most simplest way. You know, there, I think there's an Einstein quote. I'm always trying to quote Einstein, but I never know his quotes where he says, you know, if you can't explain a complex subject in a short sentence, you don't really know it well enough. So I think sometimes the less amount of words we use doesn't mean a lack of ability. It actually means a real firm understanding of the subject. Now, there are other, there are some musicians. I want to take a bit of a swerve now, and I want to ask all of you, have you heard which of these musicians did you know were dyslexic? Now, it gets a bit iffy when you're talking about who has dyslexia or not in the past, because you'd have to take a bit of an educated guess. But anyone from like recent-ish times, they were normally diagnosed. So Lou Reed, absolutely dyslexic. John Lennon, yep, I read his autobiography. Though I don't know if he was ever officially diagnosed, go, they talked to all his teachers and he had all the characteristics of dyslexia and also share. So some interesting people. And some of them were from working class backgrounds. John Lennon was working class. However, 
in compared to his other fellow Beatles, he was actually fairly privileged. He, you know, he lived in a decent-ish house. But never mind, he still had dyslexia. And if you read his books and writings, they're amazing. His favorite author was um, Lewis Carroll, who did um, uh, Alice in Wonderland, which you can also see how that creativity flows into everything they do. Now, this is a quote from a singer, Carly Simon. I don't do any, have any of you know her? She's one of those ones, when you like Google her, you'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, I know her. But the name for me wasn't completely familiar at the start. She says, my family has been given the gift of music. We have taken to music because music is something we can do so much more easily than we can do in the reading department. Yes, Sanjan knows her, great. And this is a way, I mean, it's, okay, I couldn't do something, so I did something else. That might not sound that motivating in itself, but she was able to find something which made her stand out, made her more unique. I don't know. I would love to know all of your opinion. Do you think less less choice is a good thing or a bad thing? Maybe it depends on the circumstances. I'm a vegetarian, right? Not because I want to save the planet. I do. But to be honest with you, it's not the reason. The reason is I really struggle with choice. When I look at menus, my brain gets really overwhelmed. I like having one or two things to pick from. So it's one of the reasons I became a vegetarian. And so having less choice was good for me. In the job market, maybe not. But it can also help you just say, you know what, I need one of these jobs, kind of like slimming down the selection. But maybe that's just me. Oh, yeah, Laura says, I find choice overwhelming. It's a double-edged sword. You want to say that you want choice. We all want to have choice. But when I'm giving it, uh, it's not for me. It, yeah, I don't want to tell an employer, don't give me a choice, but secretly, I kind of prefer it when I get over one, only one or two. Then, okay, another profession, which I guess maybe none of us has ever thought of, is a perfumer, someone who specialises in smells and senses and making you smell good. Jo Malone, who most of us has heard of the brand, she created a massive business, and pretty soon she sold that business now. And since then, she went on to found another organization, Joe Loves. She is very outspoken about her dyslexia. So she can't use the reading abilities. She uses the nose abilities. So again, sometimes lack of choice can actually help you narrow down your choice to one which is more, more you. I doubt when she was in school, they ever, they ever told her that one day you'll be into perfume because no one ever thinks that as an option, but it did mean that there was a gap in the market and somewhere where she could rise up the ranks. Now, I know I'm talking a lot about entrepreneurs today, but it's more about the profession. You don't have to be your own boss. It's just knowing about the different sectors that might suit you well. So Joe said, my dyslexia is not a disability. And again, interesting question. Do you consider it a disability? It's up to you but as an ability to think differently. And if this world needs anything at the moment, it is people who think differently. So that is a real big key. For me, when I think of roles which are good for people with dyslexia, I don't think of entry-level roles. I think of roles that are a little bit higher up the ladder. And that's because they normally allow for more freedom, uh, more spontaneous, more like autonomy. Now that's brilliant, right? Not if you're looking for one of your first jobs or just to get your foot on the ladder, because it's hard to get those sort of uh, innovative jobs when you haven't proven yourself at the first level to begin with. So great idea, Joe, but maybe we're still looking for what really makes a job inclusive and accessible for those with dyslexia. Keeping it simple. I wanted this up just to say one of the things which I think dyslexics do really well, and again, I don't want to generalize, but if I was to take all the dyslexic people I've ever met, very good at keeping it simple. But I would, I'm also curious, do any of you have other conditions? Because a lot of people with dyslexia also have ADHD, and sometimes we can struggle to kind of keep it simple. Or if you have autism as well, they kind of like clash a little bit. Yes. April says they have autism. Yeah, I'm, I'm also on the spectrum myself. 
which makes it a little bit more challenging when you're just looking at a list jobs which might be suitable for me because there's no list which really represents you. The next one is Nick Jones. Now, I think really recently he's just stepped down after, I want to say, 27 years as the CEO of Soho House, like a really high end club. And he's a restauranteur. Now, a lot of people who are neurodiverse tend to be in like the uh, service industry. And let's be real, it's normally because they're the most easiest jobs to get at the beginning. However, it's really hard work. It's so much concentration and moving around. So what people will try to do is rather than say get your traditional like degree and then try to find a job at like a medium level, people start at the bottom and work their way up. And this is exactly what Nick did. He started at the bottom, he realized he was good at it, and then he thought, screw it, why can't I do this myself? So he did. Be also interesting to know in the chat, like what jobs have you all been, what, what jobs have you done in the past? You know, what, have they been good for you or have they been completely terrible? A quote from Nick says, one great advantage of being dyslexic is simplification. Great, we've heard this before. Simplifying things allows for better decision making and is a real help when running a company. So we're starting to see a few trends here. Jobs which allow people to communicate verbally, but also that have an advantage in being able to do it in a very succinct, to the point way. Storytelling, another great asset of those with dyslexia. Now, I mentioned earlier that a lot of people with dyslexia do tend to be really great salespeople. All sales is, is storytelling, storytelling with passion. If you're someone who loves talking, telling stories, bringing things to life, this could be an area that you could be well suited for. Now, when you say sales, it sounds a bit of a dirty word, but there's things you can do. Like technically, I'm in sales because I go to companies talking to them about neurodiversity and helping people. But it doesn't feel like sales to me because it's something I believe in and it actually is doing good in the world. So do not think that you just have to be going around like selling microwaves. There's lots of other areas where you can branch off into. Oh, Hannah's done product management. Not a great fit. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I worked as a um, production manager at a TV company years ago and I thought it was my dream job. It was terrible. Honestly, it was not the right fit for me. It was the pace, it was the attitude, it weren't very accepting. Now, whether or not that was the whole industry, or if it was that particular company, or if it was just that manager, it's hard to say because I didn't obviously try all the areas. But either way, a bad experience can really put you off and it makes it hard. Oh, April says, I once had a job as an Avon rep. rep. I mostly sold to friends and family, but I quit after five years due to not having many other customers and wanting to focus on my MA at uni. Well, April, five years is pretty decent, but those jobs are challenging. I used to help my mum with those like similar positions. And you're right, once you run out of friends, it's really difficult to sell to, but you gave, you gave it a really, really good go. Next is carpentry. Now, this one is close to my heart because I, I love carpentry. I don't do it as a business because for me, I like to keep some hobbies as a personal passion. I don't know, have any of you had the experience where you have something you really love doing, you try to monetize it and make money out of it, and you stop loving it? That, for me, is one of the worst things you can do, to lose your passion because of like the culture or the work environment. So for me, I do it as my own thing. But either way, a lot of people with dyslexia will say they're good with their hands. And one person who this was very true for was Ingevan Kamprad, probably pronounced his name wrong, but he was the co-founder or I think the founder of IKEA. Now, IKEA was actually one of my first jobs. Um, I actually really liked it. My job was looking after the rug department. <laughs> uh, I just moved rugs from one part of the store to the other part. It wasn't going to be a job forever. I ultimately got fired for eating too many meatballs. We used to get them for free as staff members. Rather embarrassing, but fun story nevertheless. So why was carpentry a good fit for Ingmar? For him, one, he was good with his hands, but two, he really struggled with memory and with numbers. And 
isn't it true that most people with dyslexia, reading is a very, very small part of it. For a lot of us, it's also to do with concentration, memory, recall, retention. So what he did is he named all his furniture after really memorable Swedish names. To us, it sounds like gobbledygook. When I, go in the, when I worked there, I was like, I am never going to be able to remember any of this. But for him, it worked. Um, so he was definitely creating a system that worked for him rather than one that would work for years later for me. But, you know, I applaud him for, her, for his approach. He also created instruction manuals, that, which were all pictures. And this is one of the reasons why IKEA can save costs because they don't have to print things and translate things in multiple languages. And also, it's, you know, a lot of people find pictures easiest. He was a very visual thinker. And all of these kind of little quirks, which you might have called adjustments or sacrifices because of his dyslexia, actually is what made IKEA so iconic and memorable in all of our hearts and minds. Ooh, Sunjan says, I wanted to be a woodworker, but the school was sexist and it disallowed girls to do it. Parents wanted an academic route. That sucks, to be honest with you. It really does. And it, I think it does prove that dyslexia can be a barrier. But it's only one barrier. And in life, there's multiple barriers and hoops and bars we have to jump over in order to get there. I had a different um, experience. When I was in school, I was so bad at it that they actually uh, kicked me out of doing academic subjects because they thought I was going to fail. So they gave me a choice. You have to do uh, childcare or bricklaying. And all the women did childcare and all the guys did bricklaying. Now, I didn't want to do childcare, but the fact I couldn't pick it wasn't great. But I also didn't want to do bricklaying. So they limited me so much. So my dyslexia meant that I couldn't do like English language and science and other subjects. And my gender limited more so. So I started getting whittled down further and further to eventually I said, I don't want to do this anymore. And I left school and then I just worked really, really hard at filmmaking. And that's what got me into college. It was tiring, but that kind of, uh, I'll do my own thing, was my saving grace. Otherwise, I'd probably be on benefits for the rest of my life, which is fine for some, but it wouldn't have been what I wanted from my life. Oh, Sanjan also enjoyed working with metal at school and still enjoys jewellery making. Nice. I really struggle with things that are like really fiddly. So that's great for you. <laughs> Oh, Laura says, I enjoyed creating and selling ideas to motivate people slash orgs to collaborate on shared initiatives, policy and strategy roles. As long as I have the freedom to spot and pursue opportunities for myself, being entrepreneurial. Nice. And a lot of us are entrepreneurial, but not all of us want to be entrepreneurs. So you could be an intrapreneur. That is someone who is who's in a company who helps innovate from within. You know, you can use that skill set in more than one place. So please do not think that I'm saying the only route for you possible is to be your own boss. Because for some people, that's just not for them. I like being my own boss, but I also don't like it being my only income. So this is why I like being an employee. Because for me, it balances out my stress and anxiety. So what I did, I found a company which allows me to innovate within it. And that allows me to have the best of both worlds, that stability, but also that creativeness. And if I didn't have those two things, it wouldn't be meeting my needs. Now, here is a quote from the late Lord Richard Rogers, I believe died in 2021. He was a really famous architect. I don't know the names of his building, but there's one in London, which basically looks like it's a building turned inside out and all the tubes and gas and ventilations are all on the outside. I think it looks ugly personally, but still very unique. And he says dyslexics have a way of looking at problems and turning them on their heads. He definitely did that with his architecture. There's a very exciting way of doing things. You don't accept the standards because you don't know what the standard is. That's another really good point. We might struggle with knowing the rules of the game, particularly those of us who have other neurodivergent conditions. I know with like the autism side, knowing the rules of the game can be really difficult or impossible. So you kind of create your own. And sometimes, quite often, it might not work. But when you find that time where it does work, 
you're really onto something. And I think that really worked for Lord Richard. Sounds so fancy saying Lord, doesn't it? Oh, Sanja says, didn't Rogers do the Lloyds building? I want to say yes, but I cannot confirm it. I trust you, though. So I'm going to say yes, he did. <laughs> um, I know he is very well known. I just really struggle to remember all the buildings' names. So quick question back to all of you. What challenges do dyslexics face when finding employment? We talked about all these skills, which is amazing, but we can't beat around the bush. There are some blockers which can make it harder for us to either find the role we want, to find the job, find the employer, or anything really. I, I think a lot of the time people see dyslexic as a really one dimensional condition, but what they fail to realize is it affects every single element of your life. So something which is a little bit difficult becomes really difficult. So any challenges which you think are maybe more like um, affect people with dyslexia more than those who do not. Oh, April says employers not understanding dyslexia or other types of neurodiversity. That is a real big one. People do not understand it. They might think they do. But their knowledge is out of date. It's just archaic. And they make decisions based on old knowledge or preconceived ideas or biases. We've got competency interview questions. Absolutely. We are set up to fail those competency questions, not because we're not competent, um, competency, because, but because the questions were created for a neurotypical mind. They're looking for people to solve problems in a certain way. Now, our brains do not solve problems that way. So we're always going to fail. It's kind of ironic, though, because they want people with our skill set but they create it in a way that they accidentally screen people like us out. I, when we work with companies, so many of them really want to help people with dyslexia, but they just do not want to take away those multiple choice competency questions because they like having a very rudimental yes or no, you're suitable, you're not suitable. We've also got case studies. Yeah, confident issues. Unfortunately, confidence is a really big one. Remember how I said dyslexia in itself can be a challenge, but it is hardly the main icing on the cake. Everything else that comes with it is what can be the really debilitating factor. Interviews, absolutely. I mean, even getting an interview is more challenging because not all of us have people in our lives who can check over our work. Like, you know, I'll make a CV or Photoshop. It will be beautiful. It will look so creative and lovely. And yet I can check it and I can check it twice, like old St. Nick, but there'll be spelling mistakes no matter how many times I look at it. So I'll, someone will look at it and they'll bin it. So I've missed out on a roll just because the way my brain works is it's always trying to fill in the gaps, which is a good thing, but not so good when you want to do proof checking. We've also got stigma. When people think of dyslexia, let's be real, they think of dumb, stupid, incompetent, not being able to read. Now that is changing but it's changing slowly and it's a bit of a lucky dip on who you're going to get. You might get an interviewer who gets it, understands it, has some personal experience and really sees the advantage. Or you might get someone who thinks that, how did you even get here today? Were you even able to read the instructions? It can vary so, so much. I find it very difficult to recommend an inclusive organization because truly it comes down to the management and the individual people within the company. It has to filter down to every single level. Passion, this is for me, one of the biggest strengths of any neurodiverse individual is that we do tend to be really passionate. Now, again, is it due to part of the inherent condition? I don't know about that, but personally, I think it's due to having less options. You know, when we find something we like, we'll put all our eggs in one basket and a lot of the time we'll drop those eggs. But if we're given an environment where we can really nurture them, we tend to really flourish. Here's another quote from Mr. Nick, who, I, who said, to be successful in business, you need to get your peas in the right order and dyslexic people um, help with that. First passion, second great people and great product. So we've already ticked the first box just by having dyslexia alone. So we're on the right length. Oh, question from Hannah. Do you say you are dyslexic in a job application? That's a really good question. Anyone? 
what would you say? For me, yes, but that's because I spend every day of my life talking about dyslexia and I use it as an advantage. But you know, when people say, you know, what are you not good at? What's your disadvantage? You know, what's your greatest weakness? I'll say, oh, my dyslexia. However, that allows me to be outgoing, creative, ambitious. So it's an advantage. Though, would I say no? But I wouldn't recommend it to everyone because ultimately it comes down to people's understanding. If you tell someone you have dyslexia and they have no knowledge of dyslexia, it's not going to mean anything. If you tell someone you have dyslexia and they have an outdated view of dyslexia, they're going to think negative views. So I try to ask questions beforehand, do a bit of research about the company. What is their policy on different ways of thinking on disabilities? Do they have different networks and groups? And then I make a case by case decision per organization. Laura says, personally, no, but if you get an offer, you will. I think eventually you will have to because one, you're not covered if you don't tell them you have dyslexia and then you're struggling, they can't help you. So it's definitely beneficial and no one wants to feel like they're living a lie. Sanjan says, no, I wouldn't. I've been advised to declare it if offered the job. It's a personal decision and I'm not going to tell you or no one should whether or not you should or should not. There's advantages to doing it, 100%. But we've all had negative experiences. So I think you've got to do it case by case. Networkers. People with dyslexia tend to be great networkers. We might not be the best at reading or writing, so we're a bit better at talking. And as such, we're more likely to meet friends, influence people, have a larger network. Again, not, that's not true for all of us, but it's definitely something which you see as more of a recurring pattern. Another potential job is being a chef. Jamie Oliver, classic dyslexic, he used his chef abilities as well as his charismatic personality to not only become a household name, but to create many, many, many businesses. I don't know how he's created, he has over 70 franchises he's created outside of the UK. He used to have a lot more, but then they all collapsed. But either way, still really successful. He's got Jamie's Italian, Jamie Oliver's Pizzeria, Jamie's Deli, Jamie Oliver's Diner. There's so many different ones that he's created. And again, he does it because of a passion for food. He's not doing it for any other reason. He's got enough money. So honestly, chase your dreams. Sounds ultra cliche, but there's always a way of making money out of something. It doesn't have to be your own company. But for instance, if you like cooking and you, the only jobs you can get are minimum wage, there will be jobs that offer more. Easier said than done, but it's definitely possible. Oh, I can see some of you have been to Jamie Italia. Oh, Italian. Yeah, that's the only one I've been to. It's nice, though. Oh, April hasn't been to these, but she, old oh, burger place. Oh, nice. I've not been to them. They're quite good food. Arguably cultural appropriation or inf it's hard. You know, you tell me. He, Jamie Oliver does a lot of interviews around his dyslexia. And he's a really great case study on how someone turned a different way to thinking into a lifelong profession. And again, he's continuously changing and innovating and moving along. So why are some of the reasons that people with dyslexia can make great employees? And this might be good just for your own well-being or for when you're in an interview and you're talking about your difference. For one, very strong imaginative skills, great at thinking up ideas, creating new things, innovation, basically. Reasoning skills, being able to verbally articulate why they are thinking what they're thinking. You know, it's all well and good being imaginative, but can you get it out? And in a very, very simple way, just like Nick said from Soho House. Strong communication skills, again, can be typically quite good at selling. Now, if any of you are reading this and thinking, I definitely don't have those skills, remember this is taking the average of like everyone. We're all different, but these are some of the common trends. We've got expert explorers, finding new things, and connecting is a key skill. So if you notice here, it's not really saying any particular job is right for someone with dyslexia, but what it is saying is that if you can find roles which have a lot of these characteristics within them, chances are you'll probably be okay. 
is when people try and find roles which aren't catered towards that independent learning, that creative thought, that kind of socialising aspect where people try to struggle more often than not. So here's a lovely picture of Jamie Oliver from South Park. Now, I've already mentioned this stat today, so see if any of you remember, but what percentage of self-millionaires are dyslexic? Oh, nice, is 40%. Now, 40% is really, really high. So 40% of all self-made millionaires have dyslexia. And again, I'm not trying to make you feel bad for not being a millionaire. I'm not, if only. But that same skill set which allowed them to put themselves out there helped. One, being good at rejection. It's going to happen. And two, being innovative and passionate about a subject and always keep finding new ways of learning. The richest person to ever live, I believe, in terms of who created a company was dyslexic. So these are some of the people who had dyslexia, who made it very, very wealthy. We've got Henry Ford, we've got the IKEA guy, we've got the Rockefellers, and we've got Watson from IBM. So let's see if you got it right. Oh, it's a tie. The richest person ever was Henry Ford, the guy who created the automobile. Ridiculously successful. And again, dyslexic. But all of them were, by the way. So Mr. Ford incredibly well off. So much money that I can't even pronounce or read the number. Then you've got designers like Walt Disney. The, he is so successful, even after death, he'll probably never die. I'm pretty certain his head is frozen somewhere as well. So he really is going to live on forever. Then you've got other people. So an artist called Billy Bob Fronton, who some of you may know, he says dyslexia drives you because you're trying to overcome something. They found a lot of people, dyslexia and OCD, which I also have, are high achievers in things like the arts, writing or whatever, because you compensate in other ways. And I think, you know, that is a really true point. We do compensate. You know, if you struggle in one area, you tend to put that same amount of energy into another area. People with dyslexia are not less intelligent. This is one of the common misconceptions that I have to debunk every single day. We are just as intelligent, if not more, but we use that same intelligence and we put it in other places. You've also got people like Steven Spielberg, who is one of the most creative individuals of all time. You've got the Dragon's Den and two people in Dragon's Den. If you're in the UK, you'll know these people. If not, you might not. It's like Shark Tank in the US. And yes, you guys are right. It's Theo Petitis and Peter Jones. That's really high odds. Again, more and more time. It shows that people with dyslexia tend to be really great at taking ideas and doing something with them. You've also got people like Ted Turner, who is a massive TV and media mongol, created a brand new idea, the 24-hour music channel. You've got people like Charles Schwab, um, who's an investment banker, who again, very, 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 very accessible, who also has dyslexia. Now, Will this help you choose which job to take? Probably not, because I'm telling you every single job under the sun. But what it will do is tell you how you could pick any job you want. But it's about finding the right niche, the right company, the right place where it allows you to really put yourself out there. Another example is William Shulett, the guy who from, you know, Shulett and Packer. Another fantastic dyslexic. We've got Henry Ford, who is already mentioned, but what a boss. And there's also smaller companies. So there's this person who created this company called Offset Solar, a really great company. And he says, entrepreneurship is the ability to recognize the bigger picture, find where there's an opportunity to make someone's life better, design hypothesis around those opportunities and continuously test your assumptions. It's experimental or, ex yeah, experimentation. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't this sound exactly like dyslexia? The ability to recognize the bigger picture, find opportunities. For me, it's the same. Entrepreneurship and dyslexia, they overlap so, so much. So be entrepreneurial, be an intrapreneur. Allow a job which encourages you to be creative. If you find jobs which are a bit like conveyor belt, like every day is the same, maybe it's not going to work for you.
It's why I quit. Well, obviously I quit IKEA because of the meatballs, but I would have quit anyway because it was just too repetitive. You got people like Steve Jobs, who was dyslexic as well. And there's also so, 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 so many other exceptional people who have dyslexia. So there's people in real estate, Richard Strantas. <laughs> then we've got the food. So, um, you know, Dahl Food, that person who created that was dyslexic. You've got toys, the person who invented like the Nerf gun. How cool is that? And also retail, Woolworths, you know, rest in peace. They all had dyslexia and they're all different. But the thing which makes them all unique is that they had their own way of doing things. So whether or not you are founding your own business or you're going to another company, really make sure that the key thing you look for is that freedom to experiment. And from my perspective of working with people with dyslexia for so many years, that tends to be the key factor which determines whether or not a role is appropriate and suitable and enjoyable for someone with dyslexia. Now, before we finish up, are there any other roles which you think might be suitable for someone with dyslexia? And if so, why? So throwing it out to all of you. Yeah, is it possible uh, to be a person who is caring for a company, uh, for uh, some support programs, et cetera, which requires definitely connection to people and the design of, of the project some way? What do you think? So you're saying a role which requires you to be like a connector? Yeah, connector. Uh, yeah, connector and some kind of art in it. So, but uh, there is an issue because at some point it requires or uh, some assistance uh, or someone because uh, there is a, a, an executive practice at, at the end and uh, you, need to, you need to do this work with excellence, etc. And there is no more experiment when you've got this connection, finally. No, no, I think you're, you're really right, Dennis, and I uh, appreciate you saying. I think another skill, which we've actually not mentioned today, which people with dyslexia are really good at, is delegating. And that is when you give part of the role to someone else. Like, I don't know about you, I'm talking about my experience, I am never going to be the world's best writer. I can get better, I can improve, but I'm never going to be the best. But other people are. And if I can get them on board, amazing. So you're right, there are going to be roles which are really innovative, but eventually that innovation has to stop. And that is when you can use the other skill set of knowing people, knowing what they work with and delegating out. So yeah, great point. We've got also healthcare, very empathetic. Yes, you definitely wouldn't want someone who can't connect with you as like a nurse or a doctor or any sort of position. I completely see that one an artist, a photographer, fashion designer, maker. We've got teams and project leadership, strategy planning, partnerships, policy and public affairs. Yeah, again, I really do think a lot of people who have dyslexia are far better in more senior positions. Hard to get those positions if you haven't got anything to begin with, but it, in some ways it can be quite hopeful that if you're struggling now, do not think it's always going to be that way because the more senior you get, the more opportunities you get to be able to delegate and to have that freedom of being in control of a project and seeing it through. I think roles which tend to be like, this is your job, you're done, now someone else, and you'll never hear about it again, you get a bit disconnected from. But something where you can kind of see it through, even if it's while working with a team, it's more easier to get involved and passionate about it. So these are all really great ideas. Now, if any of you do have dyslexia, which I'm guessing all of you do, you may be looking for work at the moment, but when you do get work, please apply to access to work. It's a government scheme. Some of you may have already done it, but it's free. And essentially, if you apply within six weeks of starting any job, it's always free. I'm pretty certain. And you get an assessment. We find out how your brain works, what's good for you, what's not work. And you can basically get nearly like four and a half thousand pounds of equipment and training and support, which can help you retain that job. Today, we've talked a lot about what jobs what and would be good for you. But the biggest challenge after finding the job is keeping the job. And that's often an aspect which is normally not kind of thought about not nearly enough. So by applying to this, it will help you pass your probation for many different reasons. To find out more about it, go on our website, exceptionalindividuals.com. 
but know that you are eligible to apply for this grant as soon as you have a job confirmed. So you do not have to be starting the job just yet, but as long as it's confirmed, you are normally eligible to apply for it. Just a little heads up, it's a great opportunity, so I always mention it. Now, any last questions, thoughts or opinions before we wrap up for today? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about what, what is your opinion of positive discrimination for neurodivergent individuals in the workplace at the moment? Pretty much on LinkedIn and, well, certain even GCHQ are advertising for neurodivergent individuals. What do you think about this positive discrimination? Do you think it's, it's appropriate or properly explained to employers? Oh, Sonia, you give me a, a difficult question. It's a uh, tough one. <laughs> it, it is a tough one. And I am very mixed towards it. On one hand, it doesn't sound good. Any word with discrimination in doesn't sound great. And it can make other people feel like it's unfair. But mm. sometimes we need it in order to kickstart it. So if we're talking about like, oh, in this senior position, we're going to hire um, like a female. Now, that could be seen as being positive discrimination. Mm. Um, but the argument is there's not enough women in leadership. So there's no one to see it as a possibility. So though I wouldn't want to keep that type of practice going forever, sometimes it's needed in order to allow people to break into it. There's, you know, with the leadership that um, at the CO7P, I can't remember what's called, like the environment conference that's going on recently, there was only like a very, very small percentage of women on that. And maybe having more criteria where we need to aim to have a more diverse workforce, it can be beneficial. For those with dyslexia and stuff, we do do recruitment schemes, which they actively look for neurodiverse people. It's a very touchy level. I don't know, to be honest with you. I'm still like, I think it's useful at the beginning, but I don't see it as a long term solution because ultimately you want a company which is inclusive from the get go, not one that has to open the door to begin with. Because like I said, the biggest problem isn't always getting the job it's keeping the job. And that is something which a lot of these schemes, which have these positive discrimination stances, don't always take into consideration. Yeah, thanks, Nat. But yeah, really good question. And it's an open-ended one. Now, just to say we are finished for the day, but I hope you all enjoyed and found it useful. Now, if you like this, we actually do these webinars free for dyslexics and neurodiverse people every single week. The next one is gonna be Dyslexic Life Hacks where we're looking at little tips and tricks on how to navigate some of the challenges that dyslexia may face. So for instance, like different pens, different gadgets, different approaches, strategies that people who have dyslexia have used, which has helped soften the blow a little bit on some of the more challenging aspects of it. So do feel free to sign up for that. And any other things to know, we do have a lovely YouTube channel and we also have lots of other videos around neurodiversity, jobs, employment, strengths, challenges. So do check those out. And we have opportunity groups on Facebook, which you can just search dyslexic opportunities. And we also have LinkedIn groups where we share different roles and opportunities with some of our employers that we work with, that we have done training with, so we can guarantee that are inclusive. So do check us out on LinkedIn. And that is all of it. Here's our contact details. Feel free to pick up the old dog and bone if you want to have a chat with us, see how we might be able to help you. We offer coaching, mentoring, CV support. We have different jobs available. So do check us out. Oh, Dennis says, it is also a question what to do if dyslexic is together with ADHD. That becomes more challenging, but I think it means it's even more important to understand how your brain works and to treat yourself as an individual. So rather than saying, I need adjustments for dyslexia, you say, I need adjustments for these particular qualities and characteristics. Because again, you know, getting people to understand dyslexia and ADHD on their own is a challenge on itself. But if you're saying people need to understand what it can look like when you have different combinations, we're probably asking a bit much there because the different connections are endless. So I say, come at it from a personal perspective. Oh. 
Beth says, thanks, everyone, and good luck on the jobs. Thank you so much, Beth, and same to you also. And hopefully I'll catch you next week or in some future webinars.